Circadian Rhythms for Dummies, Using Circadian Rhythms to Improve Your Health. In today's video, we're going to discuss circadian rhythms at a very basic level. We're not going to dive into how they're regulated within cells or how um, various processes within your body affect your circadian rhythms. We're just going to cover the basics, sort of an overview on circadian rhythms what they are, how they affect our physiology, how they can alter our behavior and how we feel, as well as how our behavior can change our circadian rhythms. At the end, we'll discuss all of the important things you need to know to help begin leveraging the science of circadian rhythms to make you feel healthy, happy, and perform at your best. To begin, we're going to discuss some terminology that you need to know that will help you kind of understand circadian rhythms better. Then we'll move on and discuss what is a circadian rhythm, what specific criteria needs to be met. Then we'll talk about the purpose of circadian rhythms, how they kind of optimize your physiology for the environment. Then we'll move along and discuss something called the diurnal rhythm, which many people kind of confuse with circadian rhythms, but they're not quite exactly the same. Then we'll move on and discuss some examples of circadian rhythms that have an impact on uh, how we feel every day, how we perform every day, and our behavior. We'll move on to discuss the different types of clocks in the body, and we'll finish with where you should start in developing a lifestyle program to take advantage of circadian rhythms. To begin, let's dive into the terminology. What is a circadian rhythm? A circadian rhythm is a natural, internally generated rhythm that lasts approximately 24 hours. What does this mean? In other words, this rhythm is generated within your cells over and over again. Think of it as kind of like an hourglass within your cells. It turns over every day. The sand goes through, uh, generates these rhythms in uh, cellular processes, and then they reset every single day. Behavioral rhythm. A behavioral rhythm is a variation in behavior that can be dictated by circadian rhythms and the environment that follows a repeating schedule. It doesn't necessarily have to follow a 24-hour schedule. For example, uh, if you look at other animals, they tend to have a mating season, so that behavioral rhythm follows a much longer period, a more seasonal uh, rhythm than a daily rhythm. Uh, but the important factor here is that not only will circadian rhythms affect your behavioral rhythms, but your behavioral rhythms rhythms will also affect your circadian rhythms. Diurnal rhythm. A diurnal rhythm is a variation in hormones, behavior, etc., etc., that follows a 24-hour period. Now, the important part here is the diurnal rhythm is generated uh, from both the circadian rhythm and the behavioral rhythm. A lot of people use diurnal rhythm and circadian rhythm interchangeably, but it's important to point out that, yes, the circadian rhythm does play a role in the diurnal rhythm, but so doesn't the behavioral rhythm. Uh, so the diurnal rhythm is kind of going to be a, a combination of the behavioral rhythm and the circadian rhythm. Temperature compensation. Now, this is an important factor within circadian rhythms. What it effectively means is it's the ability to resist the influence of temperature on a process. So, for example, most enzymes within the body um, kind of uh, the, their activity changes based on temperature. So the enzymes related to setting circadian rhythms, if they were altered by temperature, uh, then uh, th things such as, you know, the external environmental temperature, uh, you know, it's generally colder in the morning and warmer at night, but that can get kind of switched up. You've probably experienced, a, a, um, you know, a change in the weather um, where kind of the temperature dips throughout the day. Uh, there's also a, a circadian rhythm in our core body temperature uh, that we follow day in and day out. And if these processes have an effect on our master circadian clock, we could have really weird and kooky uh, rhythms. So these uh, the, the circadian rhythms need to be temperature compensated, meaning that they are not affected uh, or influenced by temperature. Zeitgeber or time giver is an environmental cue that adjusts circadian rhythms. Light is a zeitgeber, feeding is a zeitgeber, there are physical activity, there are a whole bunch of zeitgebers. Free running period. Free running period is the a period in which zeitgeber 
Gebers are either held constant or are absent. We use this to determine if something follows a circadian rhythm or whether it's dictated more by behavioral rhythms, which we'll discuss uh, a, a bit deeper in a moment. What is a circadian rhythm? Circadian rhythm is an endogenous rhythm, an internally generated rhythm that lasts approximately 24 hours and meets all of the following criteria. First off, the free running period lasts approximately 24 hours. It's generally going to be plus or minus 15 minutes. Uh, but what, what we mean here is we're going to we're going to hold all of the Zeitgebers, the time givers, the time setting cues. We're going to hold them constant. So, for example, we could put you in a constantly light room, a constantly dark room. We could uh, not feed you. We could feed you every three hours, regardless uh, of the time of day. We can restrict physical activity or hold it constant. And um, this free running period, if, if an in, internal processes continues to show variation over the free running period, then it is said to have a circadian rhythm. It also needs to be entrainable to the environment. Uh, the classic example of this is light. So light will affect our circadian rhythms. So we can take this time setting cue and entrain our circadian rhythm to the environment. And finally, it's temperature compensated. In other words, temperature, the effects of temperature or the influence of temperature uh, are not happening on these clock controlled genes. Uh, the temperature is um, not going to have an effect on the enzymatic activity. Examples of circadian rhythms, our sleep-wake cycle, uh, insulin sensitivity, uh, we tend to be more sensitive to insulin in the uh, early day uh, versus the night. Interestingly enough, insulin secretion tends to be higher, uh, more towards like the 3 or 4 p.m. time. Uh, so you're, you're going to see things kind of not only are going to see, for example, the secretion of hormones by the pancreas when we're dealing with insulin following a, a 24 hour rhythm, but also the sensitivity of cells within the body to those hormones is going to change. So here we have two ways to kind of control whether or not a hormone is having an effect on the body. Our metabolism follows a circadian rhythm, muscular performance, mental performance, digestion, immunity, effectively most important factors for our health follow some level of circadian rhythm. They have some sort of an endogenous rhythm uh, to help us survive. And that's important to consider because, you know, a lot of these important processes, they kind of deteriorate with age or they become problematic. So circadian rhythms can help us regulate these processes so that they can optimize us for our environment. So what is the purpose of circadian rhythms? The circadian rhythms uh, are there to create anticipatory rhythms and physiological processes to enhance survival. Now that's a mouthful. Let's unpack that a little bit. So we're going to have variations in our attention span, our motivation, our arousal level, our muscular performance, our immune function, um, our um, desire or motivation to find food. And circadian rhythms is effectively help kind of adjust that to our environment within the day-night cycle. The, think of the day-night cycle as sort of what we are uh, attaching uh, our or referencing our physiological processes to. So for example, you know, we want to go to fall asleep at night, go to bed and wake up in the morning. If we didn't have circadian rhythms, if we went to sleep in a dark room uh, and you know, light was the only way that kind of set our um, set our sleep wake cycle. We would never wake up. So, you know, you go into a cave, it's completely dark, you fall asleep. If you didn't have circadian rhythms to wake you up in the morning, you wouldn't wake up. Um, on top of that, you wouldn't necessarily, if you went into a cave, you wouldn't want to necessarily immediately fall asleep. So, you know, maybe you're looking for food or you're looking for shelter, you kind of go into a cave, it gets dark, you're in there for a little too long and you fall asleep. Circadian rhythms kind of make sure that that doesn't happen. You're going to, you know, if you consistently go to bed and wake up at the same time, that's generally uh, how your uh, physiology is going to be set. That way, it's not just these time setting cues that are um, that are causing these rhythms. Uh, it is the consistency and schedule that are telling you, hey, you know, this is it's, you know, 
sun's gone down, it's 10 p.m. This is generally when you fall asleep, so you'll fall asleep at this time. Uh, additionally, it uh, circadian rhythms, which we're going to discuss in a moment, are going to regulate your appetite, which are going to regulate your motivation to find food. Um, so when you consistently eat at the same times, you're going to be consistently hungry at the same times. And, you know, not as important now when we have 100, you know, 24-7, 365 access to food, but when we had to hunt for our food, it would be best for us to want to go find food when food generally presents itself. And if you're consistently eating at the same times, that's what's going to happen. So, you know, we have these circadian rhythms that are kind of creating anticipatory cues. Hey, this is when food presents itself. Go look for it. This is typically when you eat. So let's ramp up digestive processes, uh, immune function, sleep. I mean, metabolism, everything within your body is kind of regulated by circadian rhythms. What is a diurnal rhythm? A diurnal rhythm is a biological rhythm synchronized to the 24-hour day. They are certainly impacted by circadian rhythms, but they're also impacted by behavior and environment. What do we mean by this? So the internally generated circadian rhythm is going to chronically cause you to kind of be tired and wake up at the same time every single day. However, if you are chronically awakened in the middle of the night regularly, I don't know, maybe a predator attacks at a specific time every single night, that environmental cue is going to alter your diurnal rhythm. Furthermore, if there are behaviors that you uh, kind of do every single day, for example, uh, a great uh, example for modern day societies, you know, maybe, you know, Throughout the year, you're going to bed consistently from 10 to 6 p.m. Uh, you're good to go. You're good to go. And then all of a sudden, you know, Game of Thrones comes on or uh, some other kind of show or um, event that kind of psychs you up or kind of creates stress. That's going to have an impact on your rhythms, too. So maybe you're going to now shift. You know, you finish the show, the event, um, you, you participate in a sport or what have you. And, you know, now you're amped up. You're not going to go to bed at 10 o'clock at night. You're going to shift a little later. So the important factor here is that your circadian rhythms, your behavior, and your environment are all going to have an impact on your diurnal rhythm. They're not the same as circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms are simply one component that impacts your diurnal rhythm, which brings us to an important point. Your diurnal rhythms uh, can actually promote or dis uh, disrupt your circadian rhythms. So if, if your diurnal rhythms are constant uh, and you know, you're kind of humming along, you're consistently going to bed and waking up at the same time, you're exercising at the same time, your feeding patterns are the same all the time, uh, you're not doing other things that are uh, going to um, impact your diurnal rhythms, then you are going to have your diurnal rhythms synchronized to what your circadian rhythm is. And this is ultimately what we want. We want our circadian rhythms and our bio, um, uh, our behavioral rhythms to create these diurnal rhythms that are robust. When you have your behavioral rhythms and your circadian rhythms that are kind of out of sync with one another, this is going to dampen your diurnal rhythm and maybe you wake up and you don't feel, feel quite as fresh as you normally would. You're an athlete, you don't perform as well. Uh, you go to work and you're kind of distracted. Your attention's kind of uh, not very easy to kind of focus on the day. Uh, furthermore, when it comes to nighttime, perhaps, you know, you don't quite feel tired when you should feel tired. So it's hard for you to fall asleep, things of that nature. So when we synchronize our behavioral rhythms and our circadian rhythms, they build a robust diurnal rhythm that makes us feel great, optimizes our immune function, optimizes our digestive function, optimizes muscular performance, optimizes metabolism, yada, yada, yada. You feel great. You perform great and your cognitive abilities are where they should be. So let's now discuss a, a couple of uh, examples and kind of how they work. Probably the classic example is sleep. We are normally awake during the day and asleep at night. That's because we are a diurnal species. So when we are exposed to light, this promotes wakefulness, and when we are exposed to dark, this causes sleepiness. Uh, melatonin is a hormone secreted when 
we are no longer exposed to light. That helps us fall asleep. It's important to point out that melatonin is not the end-all be-all of the sleep-wake cycle. There is evidence that other forms of light other than blue light, which has the, the biggest effect on melatonin, can disrupt our sleep-wake cycle. So there are other factors playing a role uh, other than just uh, blue light within light, as well as just, you know, light in general isn't the only factor. Uh, for example, if you are somebody who decides to exercise, you know, say you you wanted to you know go to bed at 10 o'clock at night probably not a good time to exercise or expose yourself to a stressful event or even eat because um, in addition to melatonin cortisol the stress hormone is going to play a role in your ability to sleep as is your core body temperature uh, some of the neurons that help you fall asleep at, at night are temperature sensitive which we're going to discuss in a moment Here we have our core body temperature. Our core body temperature follows a circadian rhythm, which you can kind of see by the dotted line. Uh, it drops down to the lowest point before we wake up. Uh, and part of this is due to the fact that there is no physical activity, but sleep and melatonin also lower body temperature. But then we wake up uh, and then we do things that happen to increase our core body temperature. But you look at this, that dotted line is what it simply would be if you were in a free running period, you were laying down doing absolutely nothing, light didn't change. You're still going to follow a rhythm where you're going to get a, um, a trough in your core body temperature a little bit before you generally wake up. And you're going to get a peak sometime before, uh, sometime around 4 or 5 p.m. That's the circadian rhythm. Now, if you'll look at this solid line, this is how our behavioral rhythms combine with our circadian rhythms to create a diurnal rhythm. So, as I mentioned, um, melatonin, which is secreted uh, and peaks while we sleep, uh, as well as being physically inacti inactive and not eating, are going to drop our core body temperature even further than what the circadian rhythm would do. And then when we wake up, uh, you have cortisol, which is going to increase body temperature a bit. You're going to be moving around, uh, walking around around eating, things of that nature, those are all going to increase your core body temperature. So they're going to kind of superimpose these uh, effects of your behavior on top of the circadian rhythm and create a more robust circadian rhythm. More robust is better. Think of it as kind of, you know, you're listening to the radio, if people even do that anymore. Um, you know, if, if there's a misalignment between your behavioral rhythm and your circadian rhythm, you're going to get a lot of static. Uh, the signal of the radio is not going to be very good. And um, if you do align these rhythms, then it's going to be as if you were tu tuned to the perfect channel. It's going to sound perfect. There's going to be no static. It's going to be perfectly loud. And the reason core body temperature is an excellent example is because core body temperature is regulated by the master clock, but core body temperature or body temperature in general actually causes the clocks throughout your body to synchronize with one another. Think about it like this. Uh, the, some of, You have clocks in every organ and tissue in your body. And some of these organs and tissues communicate with one another. They use signaling molecules, um, but some of them don't. So it's really, really important that all of these clocks have some sort of trigger that will synchronize them together that they all understand. And core body temperature is that factor. By activating heat shock proteins, uh, this can synchronize all of your circadian clocks together. That can help you kind of align those behavioral rhythms and circadian rhythms together so that you get a robust diurnal rhythm. As we mentioned when we were discussing sleep, uh, there are many factors that are going to affect your sleep, but uh, th the three of the you know, biggest factors are your core body temperature, your cortisol, uh, the stress hormone, uh, and melatonin. So what generally happens is we'll start with wake up time. Uh, prior to wake up time, uh, your core body temperature has reached its bottom and it's beginning to increase and you plasma cortisol begins to increase. Uh, this is called the cortisol awakening response set by circadian rhythms. You're going to see cortisol begin to increase and that's going to help you wake up as well as this increase in core body temperature. Alternatively, melatonin is dropping. Melatonin peaked during the night and it begins to drop. So, you know, sometime around your normal wake up time, six, seven, eight o'clock in the morning, you're going to have uh, core body temperature increasing, cortisol increasing, and melatonin dropping. That's going to initiate the processes that awaken you, begin that you begin to kind of wake up. Then 
Alternatively, at night, you uh, you know, we're saying 9, 10 o'clock at night, cortisol has been dipping throughout the day. So cortisol is, you know, getting towards its trough before before you know, normal bedtime. Melatonin begins to increase because you're no longer being exposed to light. Core body temperature reaches kind of its maximum, holds up, and then it's beginning to dip. And this helps induce sleep. So when we look at these things, all three of these things are affected by the master clock. Core body temperature, your plasma cortisol levels, and your melatonin. However, you can negatively impact each one of these. For example, um, if you stress your out, yourself out before sleep, that can cause your cortisol to spike, which would uh, prevent you from falling asleep possibly prevent you from having sound sleep. You could expose yourself improperly to light, which would cause uh, melatonin to drop, and then you wouldn't really feel the initiation of sleep. There are things you could do with core body temperature right before bed that can either induce or prevent sleep. Uh, interestingly, if you take a shower, let's say sometime, you know, say you go to bed at 10, you take a shower around 7, 8 p.m., and what actually happens is you take a warm shower and you think that that's increasing your body temperature, but the second you get out of that shower uh, your body cools off rapidly which causes your core body temperature to decrease and that can actually induce sleep now if you do something like the sauna exercise or uh, take that hot shower right before bedtime you're not going to fall asleep right away because your core body temperature is going to increase a bit and uh, that's going to inhibit sleep so you can see if you want good sleep you want your core body temperature to be dropping your plasma cortisol to have hit its bottom and uh, plasma melatonin to be increasing. That is how you are going to fall asleep and get sound sleep. Uh, alternatively, to wake up in the morning, you want your cortisol levels increasing, your core body temperature to have hit the bottom and be rebounding back up, and your plasma melatonin levels to hit begin to uh, drop and to eventually hit their bottom. So as you can see, if you misalign these three things, you're going to be getting mixed signals and you may not fall asleep sleep very well, you may not stay asleep, and when you wake up, you might feel groggy and tired. Interestingly enough, the um, uh, plasma melatonin and cortisol are also going to have effects on your metabolism. Um, cortisol has an effect on almost every uh, cell in the body. In fact, um, that output by the master clock of cortisol is thought to play some role in synchronizing the clocks as well, but those things are also going to affect immune function, um, your metabolism, insulin sensitivity, and things of that nature. And finally, we'll discuss this ghrelin. Ghrelin is the hunger hormone. This is kind of super interesting uh, because, uh, you know, ghrelin follows the circadian rhythm, uh, but it's also impacted by our feeding schedule. And what's also interesting with ghrelin is it does seem to have an impact on uh, our secretion of human growth hormone. So it's really important um, to understand that it's not just these circadian rhythms that are important, but our behavioral rhythms as well. So what is ghrelin? Ghrelin is known as the hunger hormone. Uh, generally speaking, when food hasn't been in your stomach for a while, uh, ghrelin is going to increase. Uh, the purpose of this is to motivate you to eat. So as I mentioned at the very beginning with the purpose of circadian rhythms, uh, appetite is really going to motivate us to find food. Ghrelin follows the circadian rhythm, but it also follows, uh, it's impacted by our behavioral rhythms, which are going to create Guess what? Diurnal rhythms. So here we're going to see, uh, you'll notice you have L, D, and B here. You'll notice ghrelin seems to peak before each of these, and it peaks the most before breakfast. That's what the B is, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Ghrelin follows behavioral patterns. In other words, when you habitually eat, Specifically on a schedule, if you are eating at all different times, you're really not going to get this effect. But if you consistently eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the same time, so if you look at here, this person, uh, well, these people, uh, this is a study, uh, and this is kind of the average, you have 8 a.m., noon, and a little bit before 8 p.m., uh, maybe even right at 8 p.m., it looks a little bit before. So what happens is when you eat at these times, you're going to get these uh, anticipatory bumps in ghrelin. And what they're going to do is they're going to make you hungry, you're going to eat, and then that grel the ghrelin levels are going to drop after each time. Uh, the, the important part here is that, you know, we have a constantly... We're constantly exposed to food. We get food whenever we want. 
However, if you eat on a schedule, you're going to habitually be motivated to find food. You're going to be hungry at the same time every day. In living kind of, you know, out in the wild, this is really important. This is going to tell us, hey, you know, we can normally get food at around 8 a.m., at around uh, 12 p.m., and at around 8 p.m. So it's going to motivate us to find food, which is going to improve our chances of finding food, which enhances our chances at survival, allows us to make it into reproductive age and procreate. So here you're seeing the importance of not only the circadian rhythm, but the behavioral rhythm. The circadian rhythm uh, is going to tie it to the day-night cycle, and hopefully our behavioral rhythms are going to help tie it to what the environment is actually doing to help promote survival, creating diurnal rhythms. Here we have a nice schematic illustration of the different types of clocks in the body. You have the master clock here in the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus of the brain. Primarily set by light, it does seem to be uh, affected uh, to some extent by physical activity, and there might be some level of feedback from the um, feeding fasting cycle as well, but primarily set by light. Light hits the eye. Um, uh, when light hits the eye, it inhibits uh, the pineal gland from uh, secreting melatonin. And then when we no longer see light here at night, that's going to begin the production of melatonin. This is all regulated by the master clock, but it also orchestrates other things. Um, but before we get into that, we have to talk about the peripheral clocks, which we have yet really to kind of dive into. Every organ and tissue, adrenal gland, thyroid gland, heart, pancreas, liver, uh, fat, muscle, gut, and you know, there are so many that are just not mentioned here, immune cells. Uh, they all have their own circadian clocks. These are called peripheral clocks. They're everywhere. In fact, every other area of the brain uh, has a peripheral clock as well. The only um, part of the master clock is the SCN. Uh, so these peripheral clocks are set by other factors. They're set by feeding, physical activity, and site-specific factors. For example, um, when we look at fat, fat secretes adipokines, which are fat secreted molecules that can regulate circadian rhythms and follow circadian rhythm. Muscle, the same way gut the same way, uh, the microbiome within the gut, which we'll mention in a moment, the same way. So we have this master clock up here uh, secreting things like adrenal adrenocotropin releasing hormone, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, regulating the autonomic nervous system and um, regulating our body temperature. And this is going to have effects in kind of coordinating uh, these peripheral clocks. However, um, the, the master clock isn't the only thing and it probably only has a very minor influence on these other organ systems. The peripheral clocks within these organ systems, um, which are going to be regulated by various factors, are going to have a bigger effect effect on their function. So we have a master clock and peripheral clocks. We want these to be synchronized so that we get these robust rhythms and that each one of those organs and tissues functions well on its own and is synchronized with the other tissues that it may uh, kind of coordinate with. For example, um, the pancreas, the liver, uh, fat, muscle and gut all play a role in regulating our blood glucose levels. So these organs need to be synchronized with one another so that they are at least communicating properly with one another to help regulate our blood glucose level, insulin secretion, um, you know, whether we are breaking down energy or we are storing it. So um, it's important to point out that, you know, we have a master clock, which has a level of uh, control over the peripheral clocks and the organs. But, you know, generally speaking, these other clocks are going to be regulated not by light, but by feeding activity and other behavioral factors. So in a way, you know, light is sort of the reference to um, these clocks. You know, let's tie the, them to something. We want to tie them to the day-night cycle. But then behavior is going to play an oversized role in how these clocks work, you know, when we eat uh, our physical activity levels and site-specific factors as well. So this brings us to something kind of cool, um, a uh, circadian clock that doesn't really belong to us, but that 
plays a really important role in regulating our circadian rhythms. So we have our central circadian clock, our master clock, and our suprachiasmatic nucleus, kind of generating um, circadian rhythms that help uh, control peripheral circadian clocks in our muscle, our fat, our liver, our pancreas, our heart, yada, yada, yada. And this is going to cause variations in metabolic processes, uh, anabolic processes, catabolic processes, et cetera, et cetera. And these are going to generate metabolites um, uh, from, you know, breakdown of carbohydrates, fats, uh, alterations in our immune function. And these host circadian rhythms, our circadian rhythms, are going to be synchronized to microbial circadian rhythms within our gut microbiome. So the way this works is, you know, we have our circadian rhythm, it causes variation in metabolism and an immune function, and then we also have our behaviors altering our microbial rhythm. For example, we're going to be eating cert during certain periods of the day, um, and this is going to kind of affect our microbial rhythms. And, and what this is going to do is this is going to kind of cause the proportion of um, of microbes within our microbiome to change throughout the day. You're gonna have the same basic microbes all throughout the day, but you're going to see increases in the prevalence of different microbes, uh, even some of the microbes are going to change their processes. So between, uh, you know, the variations in the different microbes as well as, you know, metabolic switching within microbes, you're going to have uh, uh, differences in microbial metabolites that are going to follow a circadian rhythm. A kind of an interesting example of this, uh, there is a... Um, is a microbe within our um, our microbiome known as bacteroids theta iota micron, a big mouthful here. And this guy's kind of interesting because when we're eating fiber, it will ferment fiber and, you know, create, you know, different metabolites. But then when we are no longer eating, when we are fasting, it can turn to our mucus layer and begin fermenting that. That is going to create a whole different set of metabolites uh, that are then going to circulate within the gut and then into our circulatory system. And that's going to have an impact on our host circadian rhythms. So uh, just very, very interesting. That's important. Uh, one of the major reasons why the micro microbiome is important is that it has an effect on our, our circadian rhythms, our host circadian rhythms, which have an impact on our microbial rhythms. So again, not only do we need to worry about synchronizing our central clock to our peripheral clocks, but we really have to take in uh, into consideration this microbial clock, which is going to be affected by when we eat, what we eat, even stress, things that have an impact on our circadian rhythm are going to affect our microbiome, both the composition of it as well as its circadian rhythm. So um, if you, this kind of is a, is a wonderful graphical illustration of why uh, synchronizing all of these things is important. And if you don't do this, you could see problems in such things as functional gastrointestinal disorders, which, you know, things like IBS, IBD, uh, SIBO, um, Crohn's disease, you know, ulcerative colitis, the two forms of IBD. So it's really important. Now we have this other level of complexity uh, where we're not only dealing with the clocks internally generated within our body, but we're dealing with the circadian clocks generated by the microbiome and how that impacts our physiology. So this kind of brings us to something uh, that very few people are aware of. They think of circadian rhythms. They think that the circadian rhythm is the most important thing. Uh, the circadian rhythm is not the most important thing. The diurnal rhythm is. That's going to be impacted by the circadian rhythm and the uh, behavioral rhythm. So people, you know, when they're quote unquote trying to optimize their circadian rhythm, you know, they may adjust their light environment. They, you know, may block blue light at night and they may follow time restricted eating and have a fasting and feeding cycle. Those are certainly going to help, but they are not going to build a robust diurnal rhythm. Uh, they're not sufficient on their own. They'll create these circadian rhythms and for the most part, if you consistently follow them, you will feel better, but you will not get the most out of circadian rhythms by simply uh, adjusting your light environment and uh, following a feeding fasting cycle. That is probably one of the biggest misconceptions um, kind of being put forth by uh, proponents of circadian rhythms. They, they kind of make you believe that as long as you get your light and your feeding fasting cycle right, everything else will fall in place. That is absolutely false. Your behaviors have to match those circadian rhythms to get the most out of it, to get the, um, to get the robust immune system, to have, you know, excellent digestion, to have 
excellent cognitive and physical performance, you have to kind of synchronize these uh, circadian rhythms with behavioral rhythms to create robust diurnal rhythms. And what becomes problematic is there's a lot of stuff in modern society that can prevent us from synchronizing these clocks and from, you know, synchronizing our behavioral rhythms with our circadian rhythms that can cause problems. Things like stress. Stress impacts cortisol. You may have your light cycle proper. You may have your feeding fasting cycle proper but if you stress yourself out right before bedtime you're not going to fall asleep if you're exposed to chronic stress cortisol is going isn't really going to follow a robust rhythm it's going to flatten out and uh, you're not really going to feel great when you wake up you're not going to feel like you have tons of energy and you're not going to be able to fall asleep alcohol disrupts the circadian uh, rhythms uh, specifically and obviously it is a behavioral rhythm that can have negative impacts on you and it has a really negative impact on the circadian clock and the liver and the liver is essentially the central hub of metabolism so when you begin disrupting the circadian clock in the, in the liver you disrupt metabolism and you will dis disrupt circadian rhythms metabolic dysfunction insulin is believed to be one of the major time setting cues that kind of um, uh, anchors the feeding fasting cycle to the day night cycle so if you are insulin resistant um, you're going to have issues with uh, synchronizing your behavioral rhythms and your circadian rhythms. You know, metabolism is the language the body speaks and every cell in your body understands metabolism. So when you are insulin resistant, insulin sensitive tissues are A, not going to get the proper signals and B, not going to secrete the proper signals, which is going to disrupt your circadian rhythms. Chronic inflammation. Inflammation has a negative impact on the circadian clock. Uh, this has been shown over and over again. If you have chronic inflammation, you are going to be under some level of circadian disruption and you're going to not really, again, be able to synchronize uh, the circadian rhythm with the behavioral rhythm. Microbial dysfunction dysbiosis we mentioned um, that there's a microbial rhythm if your microbiome is messed up uh, if you know if it's you know not very diverse if you don't have all of the functions there that you need you're not going to be able to synchronize that um, microbial clock to your clocks and you're going to have problems typically going to center around digestion and immune function but since it's affecting both of those things it's going to have a knock-on effect everywhere and finally inconsistent schedule a lot of people you know, you work Monday through Friday, so your weekday schedule is different than your weekend schedule. You're waking up at different times, you're eating at different times, you're going to bed at different times. This is going to disrupt uh, your circadian clock, but it's also going to prevent that synchronization of your circadian clock with your behavioral clocks. Where does this bring us? Where should you start? You really want to leverage uh, the science of circadian rhythms uh, to help improve your health, make you feel better, uh, make you resist chronic disease, make you fall asleep when you're supposed to fall asleep and wake up when you're supposed to wake up, and to kind of help uh, prevent things like type 2 diabetes um, and other diseases that are associated with circadian rhythms. Well, the basics are important. It's important to get light right. Get lots of light during the day, decrease light at night. How do you do this? Go outside throughout the day, throughout the day. Don't just wake up, go outside for a little bit, and then, you know, stay inside for the rest of the day. As you can, go outside as much as you can. Get exposure to external light. External light is the most important zeitgeber. Internal light, you know, such as, you know, that you overhead lighting and things of that nature are not very good at uh, helping you uh, set your circadian rhythm as far as getting light is involved. Um, at night, you want a decreased overhead lighting. While that light generally isn't strong enough to help uh, set your circadian rhythm, it is enough to disrupt your circadian rhythm, particularly at certain times of the day where you are more sensitive to the disruptive effects of light. At nighttime, light can have a an oversized effect on disrupting circadian rhythms uh, simply because of your sensitivity to it. So, you know, you're not only dealing with your exposure to light, you're dealing with the period, uh, uh, the time of day uh, when you're exposed to it and the specific type of lighting. So rather than kind of exposing yourself to overhead lighting, you may want to have lights that are kind of on a table that are down very, very low. You want to use more warm light. You can use incandescent light. You don't necessarily have to have lights on at all. You can use blue blockers, but 
generally speaking, that is not sufficient uh, because other types of light, not just blue light, are going to negatively impact your circadian rhythms, and they don't simply do that through melatonin. That's kind of the assumption. That's why, you know, you see people posting studies all the time, like, hey, see, you know, if you get exposed to any sort of blue light at night, it's going to disrupt your melatonin levels. But that's under the assumption that the melatonin levels need to be sky high at night to help you fall asleep. And there are there is evidence that that's not the case. Um, other you, rather than just blocking a single wavelength of light, you want to bring all light down. You want to lower the intensity of all light, and you don't necessarily want to completely remove blue light exposure. Uh, that's kind of why you know blocking blue light isn't the kind of the end all be all, and may actually have a disruptive effect. So you know just. Shut off all your overhead lights, use warm light, use as few lights as possible just to prevent you from stumbling around and breaking things. Um, and that should help you get your light right. But you know, above all else, we, there, there have been studies, the more you are outside and exposed to outdoor light during the day, the less disruptive effect that you know internal lighting can have, artificial lighting can have on your circadian clocks at night. Set a consistent sleep schedule that works and stick to it. The most important thing is that you stick to it. Do not change your sleep-wake schedule on the weekends. People do that too much. You're better off picking a kind of a, an in-between uh, schedule and sticking to it. So let, let's say, you know, perhaps uh, during the week you go to bed uh, at 10 p.m. and wake up at 6, but on the weekends you go uh, stay up until 12 and sleep until 8. You're better off consistently going to bed bed at 11 and waking at 7 then changing that over the weekend it's disrupting uh, and ultimately you're probably going to end up more on that 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. schedule anyway set a consistent feeding fasting period uh, for example uh, you could use TRE um, you know eat your first meal at 7 a.m. eat your last meal at 5 p.m. and put lunch somewhere in the middle ideally you are going to stick to the same meal schedule day in and day out breakfast lunch and dinner that's going to kind of get these anticipatory effects of ghrelin which are going to make you hungry ghrelin doesn't only have an effect on your appetite there is evidence that it may play a role in, in the functioning of the brain it may also play a role clearly plays a role in, in the brain because it, that's kind of where it signals to to regulate your appetite uh, but it also may play a role in um, uh, other parts of the digestive tract it may play a role in decreasing intestinal permeability b before meals and things of that nature so set a consistent feeding and fasting period and stick to scheduled meals and finally be active exercise, go outside, hang with friends, manage stress, particularly at bedtime. All of these factors play an important role in our circadian rhythms, uh, so you really should take them into consideration. Important to point out that being active and exercising are two completely separate things. Being active, generally speaking, going for walks throughout the day or having hobbies, gardening, chores, things of that nature. Those are going to increase your body temperature consistently throughout the day. Exercise is going to um, kind of uh, work on multiple aspects. Not only are you going to be secreting uh, muscle-derived uh, signaling molecules called myokines, you're also going to be increasing body temperature. You're going to be uh, affecting insulin sensitivity as you are being active. Having more muscle kind of creates a bigger sink for excess glucose to dump. So think of activity and exercise as separate things. Um, additionally, um, you want to maintain muscle mass throughout life. So uh, strength training is certainly important uh, to help, you know, keep that um, think of think of your muscle mass as a kind of a volume button on the secretion of these myokines these uh, muscle secreted uh, factors that uh, kind of coordinate circadian rhythms the more muscle you kind of maintain throughout life the louder that dial will be up hanging with friends social connections are really important for circadian rhythms it's been shown time and time again same with stress so manage your stress uh, people think you know I shouldn't watch TV at night because it's light but you're better off watching watching like a comedy right before bed on TV than you are in reading a book that may kind of hype you up and uh, kind of stress you out right before bed. And of course, just manage stress in general. You don't want stress levels to increase too high. Uh, you don't want them to kind of disrupt the way your body. And we're talking not only mental stress, but we're also talking physical stress. If you're an athlete or you just train hard, uh, you need to manage that load to make sure that you don't overstress yourself and cause problems. That's basically 
basically it. If you think about it, the things that power your circadian rhythms uh, and that you can use to leverage circadian rhythms are the same things that make you healthy. So, you know, ultimately, uh, the reason these things sh show such a, a, an important uh, health benefit to us is because it in impacts effectively all of the ways that uh, all of the factors that help build health. And that includes circadian rhythms. You may need to do some tweaking. You may need to find when your best exercise time in is when your best feeding schedule is and when your best sleep schedule is. But once you do that, you're going to feel better, you're going to be happier, and you're going to perform better. Are you looking to leverage the science of circadian rhythms to help you look, feel, and perform better, but need some help? Well, you're in luck. One of our offerings is the Healthy Lifestyle Program Phase 1 Circadian Rhythms. This program is built around the layperson to help them understand about how their daily habits and patterns impact their circadian rhythms and how we can take that information, implement it in an easy to follow program and follow it so that we know how our changes are impacting our circadian rhythms. You'll follow weekly modules that teach you the basics of circadian rhythms, and each week you'll be given one to two tasks to help you begin implementing this into your lifestyle. Along the way, we'll measure how your body responds so that you can identify the things that work for you and the things that don't, so that you can build an individual program that allows you to take full advantage of your circadian rhythms. And for our YouTube viewers, there's a special $20 off coupon code, YT2022, that you can use to get $20 off the program, which is normally $97. So you're going to get this cool program, which is not only going to teach you about circadian rhythms, but give you an implementation strategy to take advantage of them, all for the low cost of $77, using the coupon code YT2022 at checkout. Thank you all for listening in. As always, any comments, questions, or constructive criticisms, drop in the comments section below. If you like this video, please share it, like it on social media, uh, recommend it to a friend. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We have a lot more th things coming on circadian rhythms uh, in the future different things you can do, uh, how I kind of, the tools I use to synchronize my circadian rhythms and to kind of leverage the most I can out of circadian rhythms. Uh, thank you very much for joining in. I hope you uh, saw some value in this. And again, please put some comments. Let me know uh, if there are ways that I can make these videos better or more kind of uh, enticing for you. Take care.